Good morning, and welcome to FSOS. Um, it's exciting to see a room full of people, and uh, many of you. Oh, uh, dropped a mic. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. There we go. There we go. There we go. Thank you. Many of you I count as friends, either from a Seneca context or from an open source context, and it's it's great to see you. <coughs> Today, I want to speak briefly about a very small word, which is and. Um, so, very, very uh, short presentation about a, a short word, but uh, I think an important concept for um, free software and open source. But first things first, the important part. Uh, happy birthday to the Free Software Foundation. It's been 30 years since the FSF was formed, 30 years this month. Uh, it's a little bit hard to determine when exactly you should celebrate birthday of uh, free software because you've got the start of the GNU project, you've got the founding of the Free Software Foundation, you've got the publishing of the uh, GNU Manifesto, you've got the uh, introduction of the GPL license, a number of different dates to choose from. But if you choose a middle date and you use the, the founding of the organization as the starting point, uh, then we're at the 30-year mark. And uh, that's, that's quite a remarkable uh, anniversary, uh, a major movement. Um, and we need to celebrate with cake. So there will definitely be cake uh, during this, uh, this symposium. Um, but that, that's, that's the important thing. And this is the theme for this year's event, and many of the talks will touch on this. But to really appreciate what those 30 years mean, we have to go back and, and think about what computing was like three decades ago. The first documents that I got from the Free Software Foundation talked about the GNU project and talked about the availability of the software on these. You could order tapes of the GNU project software. Uh, and this was because there was no public internet. Public internet didn't appear for uh, several years. We had 8-bit and 16-bit microcomputers uh, of many different types, many different architectures. Uh, no USB flash drives to store this type of stuff on. Uh, floppy disks of 360K. Uh, no standard networking even. Uh, forget the internet, it was difficult to connect even uh, machines that were in the same office. And so things have changed a lot. We've come a long way. And a lot of the changes in our industry have been driven by uh, free software and by open source. We use free software to run a lot of the internet infrastructure. We use it to run mail servers and uh, social media. We use hundreds of thousands of machines running Linux and other free <coughs> software operating systems to back Google and Facebook and Flickr and Twitter and all of these services that we use on a day-to-day -day basis. So happy birthday to the Free Software Foundation. And uh, for those of you who consider 30 years to be an extremely long time because it exceeds your lifetime, um, consider that uh, you're fortunate to have been born into a, a world that has a high level of connectivity, a high level of uh, computing um, capability available to you on a daily basis, in large part because of free and open source software. So let's start with a little bit of ret retrospective. Sharing. Free software is roughly 30 years old. But before free software, we did have the sharing of software. In fact, if you go back to the start of computing, and you look at the very earliest machines, which were usually one-offs that were built by a school um, or by some uh, organization for a military project or something like that. Those one-off machines often had software published for them in academic papers, in research journals, that type of thing. I recall reading a paper about a computer at the University of Toronto 
that had been hand built from a bunch of relays and I think some vacuum tubes as well. And they were very excited that they had wired it up to a speaker. And they wrote this entire paper about generating musical tones with a the computer. They published all the source code for doing that. And they weren't particularly concerned about it being taken and used elsewhere because there was no other machine on the planet that could run that code. Um, but from the beginning, there was a sense of, of sharing. Uh, as the industry developed and as we started to see machines that were produced in uh, mass quantity, software was uh, really originally viewed as something that went along with the hardware. Uh, if you are buying a computer to do payroll stuff, then they had to provide some software to you to do the payroll stuff. Uh, they had to provide an operating system, and that just sort of went with the machine. Um, it didn't really occur to companies in the, in the very early days that the software was, was something separate that should be charged or uh, um, separated from the hardware. In those early days, there were uh, often meetings of owners of these large machines where they would swap tapes. They would take uh, the nine track reel to reel tapes, they'd get together, they'd say, oh, I've got some improvements in this, or I've got a, a piece of software for that. And uh, tapes were swapped between, uh, between the owners of these machines and the system administrators of these machines. Then along came uh, microcomputers. In the 70s and into the 80s, we had the early microcomputers, no significant networking of them. Uh, public internet was not available. Uh, we had a little bit of uh, modem communication going on. Uh, and the idea of a face-to-face -face swap continued. Uh, lots of organizations, lots of user groups had uh, floppy swaps and tape swaps where people would get together. They'd exchange software that they had uh, written pass it back and forth on physical media. And this was just how computing was done. It was, uh, it was a natural part, uh, the sharing was a natural part of uh, the formation of the industry. Along with that, we started to see the appearance of uh, magazines, hobbyist magazines and so forth. There'd be source code listings in those magazines. People would type that in. Of course, these magazines were copyright, but the software was regarded as something which you could type in, save on a cassette, share it with other users that you knew. And again, this, the philosophy of sharing uh, was pervasive throughout the industry. And in fact, in those early days, there were some companies that specialized in distributing collections of software that others had written and placed into the public domain. And so uh, users would... Uh, would write stuff, they'd be excited about it, they'd share it. Uh, companies would, as a convenience to other users, collect these together. I remember binders full of floppy disks that would be for sale at uh, computer fairs and so forth. And for uh, 50 bucks or 100 bucks, you could buy uh, a collection of many, many disks and thousands of programs. And um, so even when the software was free um, by being placed in the public domain, there was a bit of commercial activity around that, making it easy to, uh, to share and facilitating the sharing of that software. But we had IBM in the 60s and 70s start to think about the value of the software that was running on the machines. They started to say, well, maybe we should separate out, unbundle the software from the hardware. Maybe the software is something that in and of itself has value, and we should monetize that. And we should charge for it. And so you had a, a, the beginning of the, the proprietary software push. You saw this in the microcomputer uh, realm as well. This is a famous letter by none other than Bill Gates called An Open Letter to Hobbyists, dated 1976. And uh, it's a, a firmly worded letter, probably arising out of some frustration, uh, where he chastises hobbyists for uh, sharing, <laughs> sharing, pirating uh, the software that his company had produced. And this rubs some people the wrong way. Now, it, it's in the current context, it's, it's a little difficult to look back at this and, and understand, but users coming from an environment where software was shared found it difficult to understand that 
there was proprietary software that people wanted to keep uh, control of and did not want uh, publicly distributed. And there was a friction between these, uh, between these groups. Some interesting lines in here, some rather strong lines. It says, uh, to the hobbyist, Bill Gates writes, most of you steal your software. One of the first times that, that the copying of software was referred to as theft. And uh, his, his frustration comes out in lines such as, who can afford to do professional work for nothing? So we've got a clash of, uh, of context here. So this is 1976. It's uh, about eight years later, just, uh, just under, that uh, Richard Stallman at MIT uh, gets frustrated with a new laser printer. He's got a laser printer there. There's some bugs in the software that communicates with the laser. Now, a laser back in 83, 84 was a lot larger machine than it is now. It was a departmental device, uh, fairly expensive. And he recognized that the bugs in the software weren't that difficult to fix, that, that they could fairly easily be, be solved. Uh, so he went looking for the source code. He was going to patch the software and, and just update it. Uh, and it was nowhere to be found. Then he contacted the vendor and said, what's going on? Can I, can I get the source code? I'm going to fix some bugs in, in your code. And they said, well, no, that's, uh, that's proprietary. That's part of our product. You can't have access to that software. And uh, it was at that point that he realized that the environment that he was used to, the, the sharing environment, the the concept that software was meant to be shared and explored as a community and, and fixed and patched and improved was starting to disappear. That the proprietary side was starting to take over from that. And the loss of that previous freedom really got under his skin. He really found that uh, to be both annoying but also kind of scary. He felt that he should be able to compute in the way that he wanted to compute. He should have access to source code. He should be able to change the software to do what he wanted it to do. So it's well known what he did. He started a project called the GNU project. And the purpose of the GNU project was to implement an entire operating system. If you look at his uh, original announcement of the project back from 83, it was fairly ambitious. He said, we're going to write a new operating system. Uh, we're going to start with a kernel, and we're going to have some utilities. And for some reason, one of the things that he said they were going to have is uh, the game Empire. Uh, why that was important, I'm not sure. <laughs> and he said, we're going to uh, eventually add some more stuff, but we're going to start off with uh, Lisp and C compilers, and, uh, and we'll just build it from there. The project didn't quite unfold in the way that he envisioned. Uh, they ended up rewriting most of the uh, commands and utilities used in a Unix system, but providing better versions, uh, much better than the proprietary versions that were provided by the operating system vendors. So interesting thing, you had almost all of the commands and utilities of a Unix system implemented better than the proprietary vendors had implemented them, but you had no kernel. So most Unix sites, if you went to uh, to a Unix system administrator in the late 80s, early 90s, you would find that they had at least some of the GNU project tools and utilities installed on their system, but um, they were running a proprietary base operating system from one of, the, one of the system vendors. So significant contribution there. Many, many different packages, many replacements for and improvements upon uh, the utilities present in the Unix operating system. But I think that the biggest contribution of the Free Software Foundation was actually what they did with licensing. Prior to the free software uh, movement, we released software from copyright by placing it in the public domain. And that meant that anybody could do anything with that software. There was not really any restrictions. Once you place something in the public domain, uh, anybody could do anything with it. Some people view that as a good thing. If you put the software in a public domain, you didn't have any responsibility as far as support of that software maintaining it. So in some ways, that absolved you of responsibility. Uh, 
the Free Software Foundation and uh, Richard Stallman and some of his uh, um, band of merry men, as it were, um, decided to instead use copyright in a new way. And copyright is the um, inherent right that the author of a work has to control how that work is used. And this is automatically given when you write something in, certainly in most Western nations, uh, and now its, it's uh, copyright regime is, is respected pretty much worldwide. So he, th he thought, you know, instead of just granting a blanket license by taking a, a piece of software that had been written and placing that fully into the public domain, why not provide a license that would be uh, perhaps free of cost and that would allow certain uses of that software? But as a condition of those uses, place certain obligations on the user. And so there was four freedoms that were defined as being important. And I've paraphrased here. Uh, freedom zero, the number from zero, programmer uh, humor here. Freedom zero, the freedom to run the program as you wish for whatever purpose you see fit. Uh, freedom one, the freedom to study and change the code, to make modifications, to figure out how it works, to learn from it, um, to criticize it. Uh, freedom two, the freedom to redistribute copies of the software. So you can take that software, give it to your friends, help your neighbor. Um, freedom three, the freedom to distribute modified copies, not just verbatim copies of the software as you received it, but the freedom to distribute modified copies of that software, uh, including whatever improvements you had made to it. Now, the, the restriction that came with this was that if you distributed the software, you had to do so under the terms uh, that you received it. So you received it with these freedoms. You pass it on. Uh, somebody in the back corner? Of the, yes. <laughs> OK. Um, and I have no idea how to turn off the front row, but we'll run with that. If you, if you received it with these freedoms, you had to pass it on with these freedoms as well. And that, there was a leverage there. You got the license as long as you passed on the freedoms. And that was an interesting way of turning copyright on its head. I refer to it as copyleft um, as, a, as a play on words, but to express the concept of leveraging um, copyright to do something it, it perhaps wasn't originally intended to do. A short while later, uh, a group of people got together and um, decided that there was a need for an alternate term. There was a need for another way of referring to what up to that point had been widely called free software. This is a term that was coined by Chris Patterson, and it was um, first used at a meeting of the Open Source Initiative uh, back in 1989. So this is only a few years after the GPL was first published. Uh, the organization that came out of that, the Open Source uh, Initiative, is well known now. Um, and Michael Tiemann, who was one of the people involved in the startup of this, said that the purpose was, and, and this is a direct quote, to dump the moralizing and confrontational attitude that had been associated with the term free software, and to promote open source ideas on pragmatic business case grounds. Now, if you call, if you say that somebody is um, having a confrontational attitude and is moralizing, you're probably going to cause a little bit of friction there. So there was a bit of friction uh, right from the start between the two camps, the open source camp and uh, the free software camp. A uh, bit, bit of a collision course. Even though in many cases they were talking about the same stuff, the way that they were talking about it actually caused uh, some significant friction. But the open source initiative brought a focus on some, some new aspects of free software, open source software. There's a focus on business, a focus on using the software in a business context. 
the, the four freedoms uh, that are proposed by the Free Software Foundation are really directed at an individual. They're personal freedoms. Uh, the Open Source Initiative wanted to focus on the business use and the business case for uh, the software. The Open Source Initiative also had a greater emphasis on collaboration and on community and on methodologies. So the open source emphasis is on making great software through collaborative engineering. Concepts like many eyeballs making bugs shallow uh, come more from the open source camp. Um, the concept that many, many contributors and, and many people um, building on and expanding and developing a code base can uh, do a better job with that than a small team behind closed doors. The concept that everybody in the room is smarter than any one person in the room. These are, are things that the Open Source Initiative uh, pushed and promoted in their, um, in their focus. So three eras. The era of software sharing, where there wasn't really any sort of legal framework for it. Uh, stuff was just put in the public domain, or worse yet, just shared without really having uh, any thought about copyright. The free software movement, which developed a legal framework around that, the licensing and so forth that would be necessary to protect freedoms, and uh, to, to give it a name, to give it some focus, to draw attention to the concept of freedom in the use and development of software. And then the Open Source Initiative, which built on those concepts, moved away from some of the uh, perhaps high rhetoric that was associated with free software, added an emphasis on business use, on collaboration, on software development method methodologies, and on the production of quality software. Bit of a collision course here. That's the background. Let's go back to the word and. This is a word that I really want to focus on here in the context of free software and open source. We have often talked about the free software camp is looking at things this way, the open source camp is looking at things this way. I would really like to, to focus our attention on the fact that free software and open source are not necessarily different things that there are two ways of looking at the same thing in, uh, in many situations. Consider this. The vast majority of projects that identify themselves as being open source projects use licenses that the Free Software Foundation would consider a free software license. So effectively, that means that software that is viewed by the people that write that software as being open source could be viewed by another party as being free software. It's not free software over there, open source over there. It's one thing being looked at from the left and from the right. Two different views of exactly the same software. Notice that I spent a lot of time and money researching this quantity, vast majority. Um, no, that's just my off the top of my head estimate. But um, I think if you look at the licenses in a large software distribution, uh, you'll find that the vast majority of the licenses that are classified as open source are also classified as free by the FSF. Here's an interesting counterpoint, though. This is a, a quote from Richard Stallman. And it's about this year's FSOS 2015 infographic. And uh, commenting on it, he said, your infographic, you may have seen this infographic in some of the emails that we sent out or some of this, the banner posters that we've got. We've used portions of it on our website and a number of different materials. He said, your infographic says open source, a term which stands for rejection of my views. So, at the same time that one piece of software can be viewed as being free software and open source both, there's still strong, strong feelings about one view by the people that hold the other view. 
So there's, there's a, a real, a real uh, edge, a real conflict that's present here. I want, to, I want to dig into that a little bit. I want to look at uh, something that grates people, some people in our communities, and that's the question of permissive versus copyleft licenses. So a permissive license, uh, as we all know, permissive license enables you to make a non-free derivative of a piece of software. Let me say that again. A permissive license let you make, lets you make a non-free derivative of a piece of software. If you are going to take an open source project's code, incorporate it into a television, you may do so and not pass on the code to anybody who buys that television. You can take that code and run with it. And we've seen some examples of this where open source software has been incorporated into proprietary projects. Uh, a very early example of this perhaps was uh, the TCP IP stack that was incorporated into Windows. It has had its origins in the BSD project and the BSD permissive license allowed uh, Microsoft to take that TCP IP stack, incorporate it into Windows as a proprietary uh, software offering and not pass back the improvements that they made to that code to the original project or to the people that bought their software. Copyleft licenses, on the other hand, have um, a requirement that derivatives remain free. So once free, always free, effectively, with copyleft. If you had taken a piece of software that was under one of the copyleft licenses, such as a GPL, and you incorporated that into uh, an otherwise proprietary piece of software, you would basically be required to distribute that software as free software, right? If you're going to use code, if you're going to take advantage of code that's been written under a free software license, under copyleft license, then the code that you incorporate that into must also be licensed in the same way, or you're not allowed to use the code. Now, if you want to look at this negatively, permissive licenses are sort of smash and grab, right? In this way that you have a jewelry thief that will just smash a window, grab the stuff, and run with it, and they're out of there. Some say that permissive licenses allow companies to do that. They allow them to take the labor that has gone into an open source project, to grab that software, suck it into a proprietary product, and not contribute back at all to the community and to the, to the project. On the other hand, if you want to look very negatively at copyleft licenses, you would say that they're a ball and anchor, that they're viral, that if you use any of that code, it, it infects the rest of your code with a requirement that it be released under the same copyleft free software licenses. So it is possible to look at either of these approaches, either of these regimes, uh, in a very negative way. But let's consider, are there any incentives to release uh, source code outside of the license. If you, are, if you have a permissive license and you're allowed to take source code and suck it into a proprietary product and not release the code either to you, the people you distribute your software to or to the upstream originators of that code, are there any pressures on you to release that code anyways, outside of the license? What are, what are things that would encourage you or make it uh, even present a business case for releasing that source? And I would suggest that there are. One, one simple example of this is the incredibly high cost of failing to upstream your code. And this even applies in a, in a copyleft uh, context, but consider for a minute You've taken code from an upstream project. You've taken that code and you've modified it, you've extended its functionality, you've added that five or 10% uh, additional uh, functionality, additional features that you need in order to use it in your context or in your product. 
but you don't contribute those source code changes back upstream. You don't contribute them to the originating project. How is that expensive? I would propose that it's expensive because every time that upstream project releases a new version of the software, you basically have to redo the changes that you've made to that software. Now, you've got two options there. You could never update your software. You could basically take the software from a project, apply a bunch of changes, and never contribute those changes back upstream, but never update the product either. Right? You never update the code that you've modified. This is a bad choice. Security issues, additional features, uh, bug fixes that are made in that upstream project are not reflected in your product. They're not reflected in the software that you've modified. This is bad. You've got bit rot. Effectively, your device or your product or whatever it is that you've, that you've incorporated that software into um, doesn't receive the benefits of the contributions that are going into the upstream project. The alternative is to repeatedly Every time the upstream releases a new version of the software, take your changes and reapply them to that new version of the software. So they've got release one, you've modified it to do something, you've distributed that, that changed version. The upstream community releases release two. It's got some security fixes, it's 15% faster, and it's got a couple of new features. If you're going to take advantage of the improvement in that code, you've got to reapply the changes that you originally made to that new version. And you're going to be doing that forever. Every time a new version of that software is released, if you want to take advantage of the improvements, then you've got to reapply the changes that you've made. On the other hand, if you take the changes that you've made and you contribute them to that upstream project, and they get incorporated, which is no small feat. You've got to convince that upstream community that your changes are, are valid. They've got to meet the technical and engineering requirements of that community. You've got to take the time to convince them um, and, and do some social work with them to uh, sort of smooth your way in and, and convince them that they should take your changes. But if you do that, then from then on, every release from that upstream community incorporates the changes that you've made, the improvements and the modifications that you've made. This is, this is no small thing. If it takes you a programmer full time to just keep up with upstream software releases, then you're talking about $100,000 a year. You're talking about a million dollars a decade just to keep up with patches to the upstream software. Contrib contributing to that upstream community can save you real money. So what I'm trying to say here is that there are, are other reasons for contributing code that are not necessarily forced by a software license. Can we take the best of both worlds? If we've got free software and open source uh, labels, both applying to one piece of software, can we take the most valuable attributes of both of those perspectives and combine them? I think in order to do that, we need to consider what is the best of both worlds? What is the important part of the free software perspective on a project? What is the important part of the open source software uh, perspective of that project? So I think from the free software angle, there's a very high emphasis on freedom. Now, we write that as a single word, right? Freedom. But you see the expression from the Free Software Foundation of that being at least four separate freedoms, and then they break it down into additional detail of this freedom. So there's, there's a number of things that are packed into that one word, freedom. The piece that goes with that the challenge that goes with that is that of obligation, right? The obligation to uh, contribute back when you're under a copyleft license. 
from the open source angle, I think the pieces that are uh, most valuable and the, the angles that, that come out when viewed through a, an open source lens are collaboration. The focus on community, the focus on a group of people working together in concert to improve that piece of software. I think it's a focus on quality, a focus on engineering principles and um, uh, the importance of, of precision and a job well done. And I think from the open source angle, we've got a significantly stronger emphasis on business than we do from the free software angle. Downside, some uses of open source, some, some perspectives on that uh, from a free software uh, perspective involve restriction because they don't necessarily provide you with the freedoms that the free software people value so highly. So let's combine these. Let's return to the concept of and. Let's take and consider both of these pieces together when we're looking at free software, um, when we're looking at open source. Because in the vast majority of cases, both of these principles apply to the software that we use and we, we apply one or both of these labels to. Personally, I want, I need, I benefit from both sides. I personally expect the benefits that we get from both sides of the screen here in the software that I use. So I thrive on the community. The community that goes into the development of open source software and the support of open source software and the deployment of open source software is exciting, valuable, and uh, a source of energy to me. I appreciate the quality that goes into open source software. The fact that so many people have looked at it, have contributed bug reports, have contributed documentation, uh, in many cases provides a really good piece of software. Um, and I'll be completely honest here, I have lived off the business of open source for the last just shy of two decades, in one way or another, uh, open source free software has put food on my table. So I appreciate that angle uh, to the software projects that I use. But at the same time, I demand the freedom that the free software uh, lens uh, is focused on. I expect to be able to inspect software for the devices that I use. I expect to be able to control my own computing environment in the way that I want. I don't read the source code to all of the software that I use, but when something happens, when I have a question, I want to be able to do that. That's, that's a, a basic expectation that I now have of the software that I use. So my software is not free software or open source. My software is free software and open source. It's both. I rely on the benefits from both perspectives. And I would encourage you to, to look at software in that way, to look at these projects and say, don't, don't put yourself in one camp or the other. Don't put yourself in a free software camp. Don't put yourself in the open source camp. Use both lenses. Take full advantage of both perspectives and the value that each of those brings to the projects that we work with. So my simple request as you listen to the presentations throughout today and tomorrow, value the and in free software and open source. Thank you. We have some time for discussion. Uh, is there any questions that you would like to raise or discuss um, related to these topics?
It's kind of a nitpicky point, but one reason why software was open in the good old days is the U.S. didn't believe that copyright applied to software. That was changed sometime in the 1970s. I just don't remember exactly when. And connecting it to today, it looks like the Trans-Pacific Partnership is going to make copyright even more onerous for us. It's going to extend it 20 more years, I think, something like that, and it's going to have more teeth. So it does seem as if there are always forces that are polarizing. I started out definitely on the idea of putting my software in the public domain, but I have become very much a GPL person now, seeing how open domain software has been abused and exploited. And an example that you um, gave about the TCP IP stack in Microsoft, I think a more egregious example would be Kerberos, where they took their SPAT standard and changed it without explaining it so anybody else could interact with it. So I've become more militant as time goes on towards the um, free software side of things. But I absolutely agree with your point. A terrific talk, and it's not one side or the other. The, certainly, the copyright regime has changed over these last number of decades. The patent regime also uh, is a barrier to some of the work that we do. There are many software patents which are uh, trivial and stand in the way of uh, free software and open source implementations of protocols, of algorithms, um, of, of <coughs> compatibility um, uh, mechanisms, uh, file readers, those sorts of things. And so there's, there's definitely uh, an evolving legal landscape that is a bit of a minefield uh, bit of a minefield for us. Mike. Uh, this is a not a fully formed question, uh, but with the, um, because who doesn't like playing Pablo Bingo, uh, with the emerging Internet of Things, which I guess is just a word for everything happening to the stack and doing stuff, um, do you see that there is, do you see any difficulties or any conflicts around the idea of providing, like, on one hand, providing like a really high degree of quality in a product, a really high degree of uh, reliability, and on the other hand, allowing that degree of accessibility and modifiability uh, within your code. I mean, we've already seen we've already seen a lot of bootloaders that are crypto locked, so effectively, it doesn't matter if you can, you know, doesn't matter if the code is open source or not. You can't effectively modify the device. Um, but do you see that there are any challenges there? And, uh, and if you do, do you have any proposed remedies for how we can keep? Uh, the devices around us sort of transparent and understandable while also having us not accidentally set our house on fire? Uh, excellent question. Internet of Things. Does anybody have a single global definition for Internet of Things? <laughs> right now we're in a bit of a wild, wild west with respect to I IoT, right? Um, and in fact, if, if anybody comes up with yet another Wi-Fi or Bluetooth enabled color changing light bulb, I think I'm just going to stab myself and die. Uh, but right now, we're at the start of things. There are so many different protocols, so many different approaches uh, that, that it's crazy. But yes, do you want, do you want a TCP IP connected light bulb to have a microphone in it? What could that do? If you <laughs> indeed. So I think that that the value of access to source code for modification, but even as a bare minimum for auditability in IoT is going to be pretty critical. Um, I thought it was interesting you mentioned IoT possibly being defined as any device with a TCP IP stack. Um, interesting piece. 
how much do you pay for a TCP IP stack? Zero. Zero. 20 years ago, TCP, well, a little over 20 years ago, TCP IP stack cost $400 a seat. It was, it was something that you paid for, right? For every, every desktop machine, you, you paid that kind of money for the TCP IP stack by itself. Um, $400 per internet connected light bulb or per uh, one of 50 or 100 or 500 IoT devices that you'll end up with in your home is nuts. Right? So the only real way to make IoT work is a different licensing regime than, than you know, very high charges per device. And really, in many cases, that's only enabled by free software and open source. <coughs> but then, building on top of that, what, what happens? What, is, what are those pieces? What are the security vulnerabilities going to be in your house when you've got a couple hundred devices that are all talking to each other, or split into six different groups that talk to each other within their group and don't talk to the other groups, which is more likely what's gonna happen in the short run. Um, and yeah, what, what sort of privacy concerns does that raise? What's the role of free software and, and open source in addressing that? I feel that that that's, plays a key role. Um, anyone's comments on that? free software and open source in the IoT space. Uh, correct. Um, there's definitely, I feel, some educational opportunities here. Because we're going to have to, on, I feel we have to onboard a lot more conscious thinking about security. The criminal elements of our own society have beaten us to the internet of things. The example I love to, to trot out for this is they're taking cheap MIPS-based routers, sticking them in the uh, bottoms of coffee pots and um, kettles, programming them to connect to any open Wi-Fi and forming botnets for sending spam. And these are shipped out through AliExpress, Daily Screen, and end up in people's kitchens. How do we raise awareness? How do we teach that this is happening and that how do we get people to treat it as a public health issue almost. Although that may be straying a little bit from what we can do with free software and open source sure. licensing and, and terms, but yes, valid, valid concerns. That's an interesting okay. uh, you know, line that I've heard recently, which was great, was that in an Internet of Things equipped house, the difference between, there's no distinction to be made between having your home network compromised and effectively having your house being haunted. <laughs> and there may actually be no distinction between having your home network compromised and having your IoT devices turned on. Yeah. That's probably the, the case that's, that's coming at us. In the back. I think something that is kind of like a hard skill to swallow is um, there's always a trade off between the feeling of security and the conveniences that open source provides, especially with all these devices that are becoming integrated in our homes. I think if, if we want the convenience, sometimes we have to sacrifice a little bit of that feeling of security. One of the biggest examples would be um, what you know the cost of changing environments with something like Facebook, for example, their privacy settings, freaking people out, their updates, freaking people out in terms of security on your, on your devices. Um, but it's, it's sort of like what you're paying for that convenience is your game through your your um, your freedom, your, your security is kind of like the currency you're using to get that convenience is, is your own personal privacy. So you're saying effectively that um, that there's a, a trade-off here between What's the open source angle to, to this trade off that you're talking about between security, convenience, and, and well, funding? With, with the open source, I mean, anyone has access to every single aspect of, of the program that you're using. Anyone has the ability to modify and change things. Everyone can see the inner workings of software, giving them, I guess, more control over the devices that were used in software. So, for example, like if uh, you know, devices in your home are, are based on this open source software, and you give Hacker, a more in-depth 
uh, perspective on these devices and how to kind of uh, get them to, <coughs> I guess, uh, you know, allow them access to your home or turn them over to their, their game or their control their back. So, there's less restriction on it. Okay. So uh, raising a, a valid question there. Um, does open source in devices uh, increase or decrease your security exposure? I think you could make a case either way, and the cases have been made either way. The fact that the code is available means that people are examining it. People wearing black hats are examining it. Um, but potentially, it also means that a defect, which a manufacturer could just sort of gloss over, uh, can't as readily be, be glossed over. Uh, Mike raised an interesting point earlier about risk. If we want to allow people to change software on the devices that they own, and Free Software Angle would encourage that, how do we ensure that they do so in a safe way? So for example, a device that has a software-defined radio and is serving Wi-Fi signals to your house, if you misadjust that software-defined radio, you can interfere with radar systems. So how do you allow someone to change that software, to improve it, to fix bugs, and yet not allow that negative side effect? This is even more of an issue when you start looking at cars. If you want to allow somebody to, to create an application for the in-car entertainment system or the in-car information system, and you want that information system to be interfaced to the engine because you want to get performance data and other information from the engine, how much gas is left before you run out of, of fuel and so forth, how do you allow them to modify that software to, to create applications to, to deal with and have control over that aspect of the software and yet not turn off all the pollution control to increase their, their mileage, how to not interfere with safety systems on the vehicle, how to not interfere with basic controls like brakes. Um, how do you do that? How do we provide freedom? How do we not lock down the device so that people can make improvements to the software and yet respect that those devices have some public impact, that changes that we make to these devices can affect our society. They can increase risk on the roads. They can uh, reduce the effectiveness of fairly critical radar systems or health systems and so forth. Uh, this is going to be an increasing challenge. There's some interesting ideas that have been proposed, uh, certification programs. Somebody has said that in the states where they're trying to prevent users from making changes to the uh, software on their own Wi-Fi routers, that an exception be made so that you could get the software approved by somebody who's licensed to understand the radio circuitry and the impacts of the software changes on the radio signals. They could sign off on it, and it could be digitally signed and then installable on your machine. Uh, other approaches with vehicles, we have to start looking at things like, can we fully isolate the two systems? Can we use a virtualization system to separate that? Same thing with the phone. If you're going to run business apps on your phone, actually this is a pet peeve of mine, in order to connect to my enterprise email system with my uh, phone's email client, I had to agree that my employer could wipe my phone remotely. Wow. <laughs> I did not have a lot of confidence to hit the button, yes, I accept that. Um, that, was, that was a real issue for me. But I can understand that my employer would want to be able to protect their information if that phone gets stolen or compromised. And yet I want to protect my own personal information from my employer meddling with it. We have some, real, some really interesting issues that go beyond just access to the source code to address in the, uh, in the coming days. 
We have a few more minutes. There was a couple of questions. Question here. I think it's interesting Comment. that you brought up cars and automobiles, but then I was reading earlier that Google, like in their driverless cars software and all that, they had different settings for how aggressive they could make the driver. So kind of how are they going to control that kind of software from being modified when when it comes out of the future? That's going to be a whole other issue. Do you want to be able to modify your car software? <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> yes. Honestly. I think we're headed towards some interesting questions there. Yeah. If a self-driving car or self-driving cars prove to be substantially safer than human-driven cars, is it possible that we'll have roadways where human-driven cars are not permitted? That's interesting. Could be. So one, one question that's often raised, when a collision is inevitable because of an unforeseen circumstance. A bridge collapse, a landslide, something. And somebody's going to die. Who should it be? We have got some interesting, interesting challenges there. And if as a society we decide that the person that should die, the person that the software should kill, if it's unavoidable that somebody's going to die in a collision, should be, in some cases, the occupant of the vehicle, because there's only one occupant there, and if you hit those pedestrians over there, you're likely to kill four people. What does that do in terms of freedom to modify your software? Do you allow people to modify the software and override those decisions in favor of their own life? <laughs> when, as a society, maybe that's not the, the decision that's in the best interest of the society. Uh, there's there's going to be some really interesting uh, intersections of, of these challenges. Yes? I don't think there's any more modification. I think all the, all the, all the ability is very important. Because in the auto industry, we've had cases of unintended acceleration. And the auto companies say, oh, it's because the person had the auto sorry. And, but we can't really trust them on this because that entire software factory is entirely closed. And we don't know what happened, whether the closest died or not. There was a court case with the Toyota Camry in 2005 where the defense had to hire software experts. And the software was only given under an NDA, they had to do the close back. And the only thing we had was the testimony of the defense expert. That's all we had. Auditability after a tragedy is useful for assigning liability. But auditability of software before a tragedy could have even more value if we can detect potential problems. Uh, the regimes for that would be, would be interesting to develop. And uh, come right here. That's, that's the point I want to pick up on here. Is what can we learn from the history of free software and open source that's transferable to the emerging problems and opportunities that will emerge with robotics, uh, cars, uh, the Internet of Things. Yeah. We're going to be in an era of great technological change in many different areas, all of which will have a basis of software or certainly won't programmability. And so my question is, you know, when we talk about these incidents that we've merged or learned from history, how can we transfer that in a predictive, predictive way to offset or predict prevent these sort of problems that we'll have to go through otherwise. Do you have an example in mind of how to, to repeat the question or the, to repeat the point that's being made, we should learn from our history with free and open source software and apply that to some of the, the upcoming scenarios. Do you have an example well, in mind? Well, I do an example. One principle is uh, transparency in the sense that whatever is done, be open as much as possible. The other one is a legal principle that if you've done something, you have a culpability and ownership downstream. You know, you have a benefit, presumably, but you also have some responsibility. So when you look at, for example, you're like, well, Volkswagen is paying this price right now. They misread that, that uh, if you like, uh, benefit and cost kind of opportunity. And they will pay the price as a result. That's a learning moment for them. And presumably, that lesson will be transferred to other 
car manufacturers in advance of them making that decision in the future. So that's kind of the principle I'm looking for, openness, transparency, and as I say, legal and other ownership responsibilities. That's two. There are others, of course. All right. Yes. I just wanted to kind of throw something out. I mean, the, the term hacker was used, and I'll declare I'm, I'm class of 81, University of Waterloo, so I'm a bit dated, got lots of history, but in the old days, you know, they were called quality assurance folks, and as we know in proprietary, software has bugs and the manufacturers didn't fix them in a timely fashion, but if you look at hacking, and I'm thinking about jobs now, I'm thinking about educational institutions, how can you, can you, can you, uh, slot hackers as, as the good, positive, quality assurance style hacker versus terrorists. Can you, can you divide that up and can you, can you separate it based on your argument of free software, open source? Open source is interesting words, collaboration, quality, business. The positive hacker that I know that could be a, you know, a, a, a benefit right, to this discussion is sort of fits into that slot. And uh, I'm just curious what your, your comments are there, and do you see this as a curriculum, you know, quality assurance curriculum, whatever you want to call it, an opportunity for educational institutions to capitalize on those smart people who are going to help, right, for the good of, of what we're all here for the next two days? Raises an excellent question. Can you constrain the use of software? particularly software when you're making the code available for others to modify, use, and redistribute. Can you constrain those changes to be changes only for good? Or, uh, as, as you raise, is that more of an educational issue? We have in, certainly here at Seneca, we've got ethics courses in some of our programs, but not all of our software development and um, system administration and uh, hardware engineering courses. Um, should, that be, should that be a mandatory piece? Do we need to you know, pro build some frameworks as an industry for how we look at this in a standardized way, how we evaluate the, the, uh, <coughs> the good and bad um, angles for, for hacking or, or modifying software. Some excellent questions and discussion points have been raised. I would encourage you to think about these questions, think about these issues as you attend the uh, talks over the next two days and keep this discussion going. Let's have these conversations in the break room over coffee and at uh, lunch over uh, over our meals and uh, not let the future happen to us, but make the future happen the way that we want it to and the way that we need it to. All right, thank you, enjoy your day.